Hi, everyone, and welcome to Investing Strategies. On this episode, we're sitting down with executives of two IBD50 members in the wake of their quarterly earnings reports. First, the CEO of Horizon Therapeutics shares insights into what was a huge quarter for the company, with earnings up 172% as it continues to see strong growth for its new key drug, Tepeza. Plus, the CFO of Chegg tells us how the company aims to be the Amazon Prime of education and how the pandemic prompted Chegg to push up a much needed investment to combat password sharing. And O'Neill Global Advisors Chief Investment Strategist weighs in on how investors should handle their portfolios for the remainder of the year that's been anything but ordinary. And three top stocks with stellar fundamental stories that are positioned to see continued growth. Investing Strategies starts right now. Horizon Therapeutics on Monday reported a solid quarter with big beats on the top and bottom lines and raised its guidance, thanks in large part to its thyroid eye disease drug, Tepeza, which just got regulatory approval in January. And joining me now is Horizon Therapeutics CEO, Tim Walbert. Thanks for joining me today, Tim. Great to be on board. Thank you. All right. So this quarter, by all indications, was an extremely strong one. You had the strongest growth for the top and bottom lines in quite a while. You raised your guidance. So what do you attribute the success of this quarter to? Well, first of all, our, our revenue was $636 million, up 90% year over year. And our adjusted EBITDA was $330 million, uh, up substantially 153%. So strong top and bottom line growth driven by Tapeza and it's only second quarter on over a billion dollar run rate in sales. So $287 million in sales. And our second key medicine, Christexa, delivered 108 million in sales up substantially and back on a double digit growth rate. All right, so talk to us a little bit more about Tapeza and the success that you've seen with that, uh, this new drug this year. Well, Tepeza it was approved in January of this year. It's for a very rare vision-threatening disease, uh, which impacts about 15 to 20,000 patients each year. And it had dramatic efficacy improving uh, symptoms in these patients uh, by about 80%. And what we saw is a fast uptake, reported 166 million in second quarter sales. And we had increased our guidance then to over 650 million in sales. With our results announced this morning of 287 million, we significantly increase our guidance to over $800 million, making it one of the most successful rare disease medicine launches in history. All right, and uh, when you're looking ahead to next year, what does the growth trajectory look like for this, you know, in terms of, you know, talking a little bit more about that total addressable market and, uh, and then maybe the comps that we, we might see next year for this drug? Well, certainly we see Tapeza as a continued growth driver for us, along with significant growth expected in Christexa next year. Uh, we've had significant accretion in margin this year, going from 37% up 700 basis points to expected mid 40s this year. So we expect um, strong margin growth, significant increase investment in R&D. We announced today two pivotal clinical programs for our LPAR antagonist HZN825 moving into both scleroderma and interstitial lung diseases. So exciting time as we develop our portfolio of development stage medicines, but also with the PES and Christexa continued significant growth. Now let's talk about that uh, margin growth a little bit. When you look at, uh, you know, before this quarter, the bottom line growth was a little bit lumpy. Is that something that you expect to smooth out headed into next year? Or are you taking a step back and uh, focusing more on the annual bottom line growth? Well, we had uh, over 50% uh, even margins here in the third quarter announced this morning. Uh, we continue to invest in Tepeza as a billion dollar plus medicine now, we are doubling the size of our commercial organization to 200 people, significantly increasing our direct to consumer activities as we finish out the year and go into next year. So we expect to maintain our margins while significantly increase our top line sales with Tepeza and Christexa. All right, well, in terms of strategic initiatives, in what ways are you planning for future growth into next year beyond those two big drugs? I mean, you mentioned investments in R&D. Right, so we expect to significantly increase in R&D on HGN825, as I mentioned, 
But importantly, we have over $1.7 billion on our balance sheet, which puts us in a great position to pursue additional acquisitions that can bring more development stage medicines for us to bring forward. Uh, but certainly the top line growth driven by both Tepeza and Cristexa are gonna be putting us in a great position to drive cash flow, reinvest that into R&D, and continue to drive margin expansion as we get into the mid 20s. So you are looking to be acquisitive. What sorts of areas uh, are you looking to expand into? Our focus is on continued rare disease medicine acquisitions like Tepeza, uh, which uh, we paid only $145 million up front and paid back quite quickly. So we're looking for for rare disease medicines that may be in ophthalmology or endocrinology space or even rheumatology or nephrology like Cristexa is uh, focused on. So in those areas, we're looking at development stage or R&D stage uh, medicines, but also looking at potential bolt-on acquisitions that can accelerate our R&D portfolio. Well, it was a fantastic quarter, and the stock has made a fantastic move this year. So when you're looking ahead, if you could give us uh, one final uh, statement, I guess you could say, on what you think is the biggest key to the company's success moving forward. Well, for us to be successful both uh, in the fourth quarter but in the coming years is continuing to drive our billion-dollar medicine to PESA, turning Cristexa into a greater than one $1 billion a year medicine here in the U.S., and continuing to do acquisitions and building out our R&D portfolio for the long term. So we're set up great to succeed moving forward. All right. Well, it was a pleasure speaking with you, Tim, and we wish you all the best. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Melissa. Appreciate it. And coming up next, we're chatting with the CFO of online education company, Check. That's after the break. I'm Arusha Pierce, and welcome to Investing with IBD. Every week, we are going to give listeners insight on how the market is doing. We'll identify stocks or ETFs that are worth considering and adding to your watch list. Not only do we have investing experts, we like to bring on business leaders. The response from listeners has been amazing. It really feels like we're building this community. Join me every week as we take on the market. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. We sat down with the CFO of Chegg, who told us how the company is aiming to be the Amazon Prime of online education. Take a look. Well, Chegg beat analyst expectations for Q3 on October 26 with another strong quarter of top line growth up 64%. But after more than doubling this year, shares sold off in the wake of the report. But the long term outlook for Chegg remains encouraging with the company's Q4 and 2021 guidance signaling more strong growth ahead. Here now to discuss the company's growth plans is Andy Brown, the CFO of Chegg. Thanks so much for joining me today, Andy. It's great to be here, Alyssa. All right, so uh, we have seen quite a long track record of strong sales growth for Chegg. And this quarter, though, we did see the bottom line adjusted earnings slightly dip year over year. What would you say is the main takeaway from this quarter? Well, the main takeaway from this quarter is that we continue to see strong growth, both from our subscriber base, which then obviously generates revenue growth, uh, and we're continuing to see expansion of our margins. Uh, that's one of the things that, you know, where I think we're unique, we're a, we're a high top line growth company. Uh, at the same time, we're seeing leverage on the bottom line. Uh, and so, you know, that's, and, and, and we had the courage, quite frankly, to, you know, take what we, we, we saw in Q3. And as you know, when you think about Q3, that's the, that's the time when school starts, so the beginning of a semester, that kind of translates into Q4. Uh, so it gave us the confidence to raise our guidance for Q4. Uh, and um, unlike most companies, we also gave us the confidence to provide our initial outlook for 2021, which we've been doing for, well, the past four years. This is the fifth year that we've done this. So strong Q4, nice guide up, uh, another strong and a strong guide up for 2021. That's right, which uh, also beat analyst expectations as well. So let's talk about uh, the remainder of the year. We know that 2020 has impacted uh, every company in, in different ways. So uh, Chegg has also seen that with its business, how have you leveraged what this year has thrown at you and fueled 
uh, fuel the company to make decisions that can set you up for more growth moving forward. So, so what, what, is, what, what is it revealed to us, and it started in, in the middle of March, as you're aware, when the, the, the pandemic hit and, you know, whether you're at work and you went home to work like you are and I am today, right? I'm sitting in my dining room, for goodness sake, because my wife occupies the office. Uh, but <laughs> students, students also went, uh, went home, and it's not just in the U.S., it's across the globe. So there were really two core dynamics that we saw as a result of that. And we're starting to lean into it from an investment standpoint. The first one is in the US where that's been our traditional business, right? Has been in the US college students and to some degree high school and, and middle schools. But what we saw as kids went off campus and they didn't have, there were two things happened. They didn't have access to on-campus support because they're not on campus, big surprise. And the second thing uh, that happened as they went off campus is that we saw, and one of the things that we'd seen for many years is what we call account sharing. Uh, and, and as they went off campus, it was more difficult to share accounts. And, what we, and, and so that proximity sharing we saw, and so as a result in the US, we've seen a, an acceleration in the business where, where we, we believe it's a function of primarily account sharing that's not occurring as kids are off campus. What that did for us, however, was accelerated an investment that we were going to make in 2021 uh, to have a technical solution, whereas you could, where the students couldn't account share. So if you kind of go back into the early part of the year and pretty much forever, uh, if you were subscribed to Chegg Study, you could just share it with as many people as you wanted, as long as you were only one concurrent user on the account. So you could probably technically share it with 10, 20, 30 people and they could share it. What we accelerated was a technological development that we call device management. That got accelerated. We, we introduced it in August of this year, August 17th, in fact. Um, and so that limits as kids go back onto campus, they can't go back to that old habit of, you know, that proximity sharing. So that was one dynamic in the U.S. Outside the U.S., and this is where we'd been making investments really since the beginning of, uh, excuse me, at the beginning of uh, what? 2019, well, we started making investments in international, both from a technological standpoint, content, and marketing. But what the COVID revealed to us as kids went off campus at that point in time is how, how big international could be for us. In other words, and so they found, you know, we're an internet-based company, right? So the kids go offline and they go, how do I get help? I can't get help on campus. And we saw a significant acceleration in our international business. Mm -hmm. And what we've done there is we're also leaning into that investment. So we, we mentioned not on this call as much, but on the prior call, uh, the fact that we were in, increasing our investments, uh, both internationally and for account sharing. We believe that will continue to allow us to sustain high growth 2021, 22, 23. Right. So it sounds like there are some short-term dynamics at here, uh, here in play with more students uh, being remote and, you know, mm -hmm. the expanding abroad. But from a long-term perspective, what uh, about COVID-19 that has changed the business do you think is going to have those long-term lasting effects? Yeah, so it's it's what we talk we've talked about for many years with with uh, with our investors, and that is that the inevitability of more and more of education going online, right? And so we believe COVID has accelerated that. I mean, it's 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 you know, and we we can throw out a bunch of statistics, whether it's the professors who you know back in May thought you know you know felt like you know, education, uh, online education could be affected. Now half of them think it is. So they're starting to turn that corner. And, and that's a stodgy group. I hate to say that, but they don't, they don't change much. Um, and then when you think about the students, as the students are more and more uh, uh, going online and experiencing the online dynamic, you know, 61% they believe, say that they believe a properly designed online course is just as rigorous as being on campus course. So we believe there's a there's this complete shift to where, where online education is becoming more and more accepted and all we do is what? Online. So we think we benefit from it. Right. Um, talk to us a little bit about the engagement that you're seeing with students and, and the increase in that, um, you know, U.S. and outside of the U.S. Uh, because, uh, you know, that could also be a signal of, of stickiness, perhaps. What's your take? 
Yeah, so it, you know, that is one of the things clearly we made. It's not just about the number of subscribers we have, it's the engagement that we have on our platform. And last quarter, just last quarter, like the last 90 days as it were, we had 252 million content views on our platform, which is you know, just stunning. Um, and then one of the things that is really pleases is, and, and if you think about our platform, uh, our Chegg study platform, a big part of it is what we call expert Q&A, right? So we have over 40 million pieces of content where students have asked a question, and then we have experts that answer it, and then it gets archived on our platform. 25% of all of the new questions that we had to answer came from international sources. So it kind of gives you an in, interesting uh, dynamic into what's happening for us internationally, where 25% of our, 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 our new questions are coming from, uh, from uh, international students. So yes, really high engagement on the platform. And looking into next year, as uh, we do see more students coming back to the classroom, how is Chegg thinking about incorporating perhaps some of these digital learning aspects either in the physical classroom itself or with more study materials? How are you thinking ahead for, or for when that shift you know, back to the physical uh, might happen? Yeah, so, so as we think about as, as it become, you know, we have more kids that are on campus actually learning in-person learning, was that what I'll call it, because if you think about the dynamic today, there's a lot of kids that have gone back to campus, but in fact, are not actually going to classes, they're actually doing it in their, doing learning from their dorm room. Uh, but I do think what you're, you're likely to see is what I'll call the new normal, because I don't think there's going to, we're going to go back to the old normal. I really don't, whether it's in our work life or whether it's in education, I think you're going to have a new normal and that's likely to be sometime, you know, I don't think it happens any earlier than the fall semester of next year. It may even go into 2022, but I think you're going to see more of a hybrid model on campus, more likely than not. Students seem to want it. Um, I think that, and, and for us, it really doesn't matter that much whether or not it's an online education experience or an in-person education experience. If that student needs help with their classes to better understand and master the subject matter, help pass, the, you know, pass a test or a get a better grade in the class, online, offline, you know, a, a mixed mode, um, it really doesn't make a, a significant amount of difference to us because we're going to be there for them, you know, and we're on, de we're on demand anytime, anywhere, any place uh, service. And uh, you've talked about the international growth and the plans there. You've also talked a, a lot about college students. So would you say those are kind of your two main areas of focus right now? What about other uh, either verticals or markets? Well, there's a couple of things that we haven't talked about, interestingly enough. You know, we, so what I've been talking about is what we call Czech Study, our Czech Study Pack. And, and what, you know, we, ha we have other parts of our business that actually address a younger demographic, college students to be younger de demographic, for example, on our writing tools properties. We've got 30 million students that are actually accessing our writing tools properties, and it's a freemium model. So part of it's ad supported, part of it is then you upgrade to a subscription, and that goes all the way down into middle school. And so that service actually helps and helps students, um, you know, create a citation. It, you upload the paper, you create a citation, create a bibli get a citation, create a bibliography, and that's for free. And then they can upgrade to a, to a subscription that allows them with sentence structure, grammar, and things like that. So that goes into that demographic. Uh, and we've had that service for some period of time. The other part of our business, which is much newer, right? So what I've just talked about is academic learning. And so one of the things we, we, we moved into a little bit under a year ago was what we call skills-based learning, because we do believe, and if you look at any employer uh, uh, data, they're looking for skills. It's not necessarily about whether or not you have a degree. Do you have the skill to get that job completed? Uh, and so we acquired a relatively small company last, well, I guess it was October 1st, so about a year ago, called Thinkful, where we've, we've branched out into skills-based learning for those, for those people that want to either um, reskill themselves or get a new skill into things like coding uh, and things like that. And that's, that's a business that we recently moved into, and we believe over time that will likely be a, a big growth area for us uh, uh, as, as we develop it. 
Is that the area that you see as the biggest growth opportunity for the company in 2021? Or what segment would you say provides that uh, biggest potential for growth? Yeah, the, so without a doubt, the biggest potential of growth is going to be on the academic side. Uh, you know, the, the, the type of growth that we're seeing in our student base, both, in, both domestically and international, will be, the, will be from, a, from an overall standpoint, the, the largest. But we do believe if we look, if we, if we imagine Czech five years from now, so let's just imagine Czech five years from now, we do believe we'll have a, 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 a skills-based business at scale. It's not at scale today, but we do believe, and, and that's, those are the investments we're making, because we're, we're not trying to create a one-quarter company or a one-year company, and we talk about this internally. We're trying to, what we're, we're attempting to do is create a hundred-year company, and so you have to make those investments early for those future growth opportunities. Now, when it comes to competition, I think that all, all speaks perfectly to this. How do you stay ahead of the competition and uh, think about it in the context of the different markets that you're playing in? Well, you've got to continue to innovate, right? Uh, and that's one of the things, you know, when I think about what we have done over the last, you know, seven to 10 years, we've really defined a market. Um, you, know, I, I, you know, if you take a look, particularly if you take a look in the public markets, which I'm sure m many of your viewers are in, is, you know, I, I would beg to ask the question, how many companies, education companies, ed tech, ed tech companies, or even broadly education companies are actually focused on direct to student relationship and selling uh, services direct to the student? I don't, I can't, Think of one, uh, you know, so we, we are a pioneer in our space and, and to continue to be that pioneer and continue to, to get our, I'll call it unfair share of the market, uh, which is what we want, uh, we've got to continue to innovate. And so, uh, so what I, uh, you know, I, I look at our core flywheel, which is Chegg Study, and I always like to talk to investors about it. You know, think about Chegg Study, which is a $14.95 subscription product. And we've got literally millions of students across the globe using it. You know, think of it as like Amazon Prime, right? You can relate to Amazon Prime, Prime and you may not recall, but I recall when Amazon Prime first came out, it was just two day shipping. It was a very simple service. Well, if you think about Check Study seven or eight years ago, it was a fairly simple service. It was textbook solutions. But if you think about Amazon Prime, it's much more than two day shipping today. You know, it, it, they became TV shows, then original content, then music, Amazon Fresh, kind of do all the thing and they've added an added capability. Same thing with what we do with, we've, we have done and we will continue to do with Check Study. And that is we've gone from textbook solutions to expert Q&A, to you know, assessments, to practice tests, and we will continue to add to that capability where we create this incredible mode where for somebody to repl replicate it would be very, very difficult. So it's that innovation, you know, like I said, once again, much like an Amazon Prime uh, that we, we continue to innovate in the education space. Well, that's definitely a very interesting way uh, to frame it. And thank you so much for your insights today. It was great learning about Chegg. And uh, we look forward to seeing all, all of these uh, growth initiatives in action. Thanks again, Andy. Thank you, Alyssa. After the break, the chief investment strategist of O'Neill Global Advisors shares his thoughts on election uncertainty and analyzes three top stocks with stellar fundamental stories. We'll be right back. IBD Digital gives you access to our premium content. The best of Investor's Business Daily. A team with decades of experience serving up actionable investing content, a sophisticated tool set to facilitate your own deep dives, and educational resources that will give you an edge in the stock market. We have over 100 years of stock market data all focused on one thing. What makes a winning stock? We're taking the guesswork out of investing. Subscribe now to build a better portfolio and make more money in the stock market. Joining us now to talk about his outlook for the remainder of the year, as well as several top stocks to watch, is Randy Watts, the Chief Investment Strategist of O'Neill Global Advisors. Thanks so much for joining us today, Randy. Thanks for having me again, Alyssa. 2020 has no doubt been a roller coaster ride, and it is not over yet. So with the uncertainties that are out there, how should investors take a step back and approach their portfolios for the rest of the year? I would say right now the market's been volatile and it's been volatile because investors are dealing with three uncertainties. The first uncertainty is that COVID cases are ramping not only in the US but really around the world in particular with Europe. 
And so I think there's fears of additional lockdowns, which are already happening in Europe. There's fears of that happening in the U.S., and it's causing investors to question the economic recovery, both here and abroad. Second, there is the uncertainty of a fiscal stimulus bill. Many people, including myself, believe we do need another stimulus bill, in particular to help small business, which is suffering a great deal during this pandemic. And then the third uncertainty is the election. And I think the biggest fear there is actually not about who wins, but rather, will there be a clear outcome on November 4th? To refresh viewers, the market actually fell 8.4% in 2000 from election day, November 7th, till December 15th, which is the day after Gore conceded after the Supreme Court had its ruling on the election. And I think people are worried that if there's not a clear winner on the 4th of November, we could be in an extended period of time where the outcome is not known. Mm. Well, so it sounds like investors are going to really need to be nimble uh, for the remainder of the year, but also maybe taking a step back and looking at stocks that uh, could potentially weather any storm that uh, is on the horizon. So let's take a look at a couple of stocks that are on your radar, Randy. Uh, what about in the big cap tech space? What do you have your eye on? Well, you know, we still do like growth stocks and we like stocks that we think can grow regardless of the environment, whether COVID slows the economy again or if there is an economic recovery. And we try to really favor stocks that are leaders in their space. So uh, two stocks that we like, the first one I should mention I own is uh, Microsoft. So Microsoft reported its quarter this, year, this uh, past week. It was a very, very good quarter across the board. They handily beat both revenues and earnings. The company has been growing its earnings at a double digit rate for the last three years. And we see that continuing for the next several years. Now the stock has pulled back a little bit this week because the forward guidance for fiscal 2021 was a little bit below what, inspector, what, what, what investors expected, in particular in the personal computing area. But we believe investors are not really buying Microsoft for personal computing, they're really buying it for, for its expansion into cloud. Uh, that being said, it's a, it's a very strong stock. It has a data graph rating of 81. It has a composite rating of 94, and it's got a relative strength rating of 82. So those are all metrics within the O'Neill system that we, that we really like. The company's trading at about 27 times earnings on fiscal year 2022, which is the uh, June of uh, uh, 22 fiscal number, which we don't find to be you know, overly expensive relative to the market. And we think uh, this is a real leader that should really be included in people's portfolios. Yeah, when you take a step back and look at the monthly chart for Microsoft, I mean, the long-term outperformance is very apparent here. And at IBD, it's it's actually one of our long-term leaders in a, that portfolio based on that relative strength that you mentioned and very strong fundamentals. So do you think a stock like this, uh, buying on a pullback seems like an appropriate opportunity? We think it's a stock that growth investors really need to have in their portfolios. And, I, and I, there's really two reasons why. First is, as we mentioned a minute ago, it's very strong in cloud. Azure, which is Microsoft's cloud service business, grew 48% in the past quarter. They're a strong number two to Amazon. There's a lot of corporations that don't want to use Amazon services. Microsoft's been gaining share, and we think that's going to continue. The second kind of bigger picture element with Microsoft is that it's in the long term, it's transitioning from a business that was driven by uh, really enterprise licensing and consumer licensing of, of software to a subscription model business. And that's going to make their revenue stream actually much more steady over time. And then finally, one thing I should mention as well is they have a new Xbox coming out on November 10th. We think this is going to do very well, especially in the current COVID environment where people are spending more time at home. So we think there's a lot of drivers for the stock. And we also think there's a positive long-term uh, transformation occurring. Right. A great fundamental story there. Uh, and can you talk about NVIDIA? That's another name on your list. Clearly a leader in the chip space. Like Microsoft, NVIDIA is a leader in its space. It's also a company that's undergoing a transformation. It's done two acquisitions recently. First is Mellanox which is a company that makes semiconductors for high-speed computer networking. And second, it's in the process of buying ARM Holdings uh, from SoftBank. 
and there, Arm is really a leader in chips for smartphones. So I think what's most important about NVIDIA is that it's expanding its addressable market. If you look at just the data center market, a year ago, they were talking about a total addressable market of about 50 billion. By 2024, they think that addressable market will grow to 100 billion. In addition, through the ARM acquisition, they're gonna be expanding into smartphones. They're already a leader in gaming, and they're actually a leader in artificial intelligence. And we think both of these acquisitions is gonna help ARM there. So while the stocks had a big move, it's growing very, very rapidly. We think it can have basically 20% plus revenue growth each of the next several years. And it's a name that we think investors should, con could, could, should consider for exposure in the semiconductor space. One thing I should also mention is like Microsoft, it's got very strong ratings. It's got a data graph rating of 91. It's got a composite rating of 96 and it's got a relative strength of 96. So uh, very positive in the O'Neill metric system. Yeah. And uh, when you're talking about the business and the diversification that, it, that it's seeing really branching out with this acquisition, what risks are there for investors? Clearly, there's also huge opportunity. And those who have been in the stock this year have seen that firsthand. But what should investors be aware of in terms of the risks with this chip maker? I think the two biggest risks for NVIDIA are first that they're still waiting on governmental approval for the ARM acquisition. So it's possible that that doesn't get approved and then they would have to walk away from that deal. That would be a negative. And I think the other negative is they, they're a company that outsources the manufacturing of their semiconductors. They're particularly relying on uh, Taiwan Semi. Uh, and so I think there's some issues of whether they could be capacity constrained on certain chips going forward. And that could also hurt sales and earnings. All right. Well, uh, we have seen some bumps in the roads uh, this year in terms of the economy, but there's a consumer play that's on your radar that you think is a standout. Uh, can you give us a little bit of insights on that? Sure. So this is a little bit of a, of a mid cap play. So it's a smaller stock than the last two, not quite as well known. It's Yeti. Yeti makes uh, coolers and thermoses for the consumer. They're very, very high end products. Surprisingly, they've actually been helped by COVID, and that's because people are doing more quote unquote staycations. And what that often means is doing outdoor sports near their homes, whether it's hiking or biking or going on a picnic. And that actually plays quite well to Yeti. In addition, they're expanding geographically into areas like the UK, New Zealand, and Australia. And so we think this is a growing high end consumer brand that can continue to grow its revenues at a double digit pace. They've been seeing an expansion of margins and we think earnings, uh, which are up very strongly this year, they're up about 130% this year, can grow north of 20% over the next couple of years. We think that's a pretty interesting name. If you look at its es what it's trading out on estimates, it's about uh, 30 times its uh, 2021 estimate. And like Microsoft and NVIDIA, it's got very strong O'Neill ratings. So it's got an 84 uh, data graph rating, a 97 on the composite, and a 92 on relative strength. And again, at O'Neill, we want to not try to guess what the trend's going to be. We want to follow and respect an existing trend. All three of these stocks are leaders in terms of relative strength, and all three of these stocks rate really highly in our data graph system. Yeah, which means that not only are they standouts from a share price performance perspective, but those fundamentals as well and what's really driving the company forward in terms of growth. Absolutely, absolutely. And we still want to stick with growth stocks. I know a lot of investors have been piling into more cyclical and more value related stocks, but we really want to stick with growth until we see that clear turn in the economy. Uh, while the economy has obviously improved sequentially, uh, Q3 versus Q2. It's still, you know, down from where it was pre-pandemic. Uh, and so we really want to stick with growth for now. All right, Randy. Well, it's a pleasure as always. Thanks so much for sharing your perspective today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. And thank you all for watching this episode of Investing Strategies for Investors Business Daily. I'm Alyssa Corum. Hi there. Thanks so much for watching Investing Strategies on our YouTube channel. If you want more executive interviews and analysis of key trends to watch, make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can stay up to date.